Okay, so it's just me between. I'm the last one of the day here. Normal, if this were like a normal conference, you guys would be all liquored up. So, I'm, so this is hopefully going to uh, try and be a little entertaining here at the end of the day. Um, so I want to thank uh, Elise and all the uh, organizers for the opportunity to talk to you. And when I th I heard I could talk about you know the new directions. Um, uh, for ENCODE, I thought, wow, I, okay, I get to be a visionary, uh, but all I came up with uh, often was things that were pretty related to what we were doing in the lab, because I guess that's what I know. Um, so uh, I, I'm going to, uh, actually, there's going to be some pretty concrete stuff, some uh, preliminary data, and if I sound like I'm trying to sell you something, I really apologize for that, uh, but I'd love to have feedback on some of these directions. So th thank you. Um, so, okay, so I need an obligatory so analogy of what ENCODE is. Um, so right now, I think uh, quite, quite often, um, uh, a lot of the data sets aren't so much an encyclopedia as an atlas, right? So I can look at the, a map of the United States, or of the world, and uh, see political demarcations, or I can see topography, or I can see land, uh, you know, um, this is surface temperature, and then of course things like connections between different airports, right? So that's sort of more like the high sea stuff, and I can look at this stuff in a, in a browser. So I guess the first part part uh, that I want to ask are, are, are there other sort of maps that we're missing and, and what might be um, interesting in that direction? And then, of course, the other side of this is actually building the encyclopedia. Um, so here, for example, Brussels, <laughs> this is, this is, a, this is a, a regulatory element in, in my analogy here, um, and there's lots of interesting information here. This, of course, is from Wikipedia, which is crowdsourced. I think it's above my pay grade to determine whether or not that's a good model system for doing ENCODE, but it might be something worth thinking about. Um, and so the other uh, parts uh, that I'll be talking about will be sort of talking about how to actually get at functional relevance for these uh, regulatory elements and understand how, what they're actually doing. So again, projects are either going to provide new types of genomic uh, maps or uh, high throughput hypothesis less functional validation uh, and a quantitative understanding of how, how those uh, elements are, are operating. And here's a quick outline. First, I'm going to talk about a new method to try and get a chromatin secondary structure, uh, looking at single cell regulatory information. Uh, I'm going to pitch a quantitative uh, biochemical investigation uh, of, of DNA sequence and how uh, changes in sequence affect structure and function of either uh, encoded or binding macromolecules. And then uh, also, uh, obligatorily maybe, I have to <laughs> pitch something to do with CRISPRs. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, high throughput and combinatorial CRISPR uh, screens that might be able to get at, at least in a cell, uh, cell uh, line context, um, some understanding of functional validation. Okay, so the first. So that's four things in 10 minutes, so we're going to go fast. Um, so here's chromatin structure at all length scales, one base, 10, 100, et cetera. And I made this figure, so there, it's obvious that there's a big gap here um, right at the level of maybe kilobases. So how is chromatin folded at the le level of hundreds to thousands of bases? I think this is a really uh, a missing uh, uh, portion of our understanding of the topology of DNA. And this is the length scale of uh, enhancers and, tr and transcription start sites and things like that. Um, there's lots and lots of methods for looking at sort of this linear primary chromatin uh, sequence. And there's all these tertiary uh, things. And of course, I would, I would argue that these are especially exciting, perhaps capture-based high C and, and, and Chia Pet maybe pulling down Paul two and things to, to really get at functional interactions. But as I've as I've drawn, um, there's this big gap. Um, We've, we've been, uh, like, stole an idea from uh, Rydberg et al. from 1998, and I, I as an aside, I, I think um, it's, it's always fun to look at old papers and say, okay, now that I have sequencing, what should I do with, uh, with this, this uh, t a technique that uh, exists? Um, so the way this works is a high-energy photon comes into chromatin. It interacts with water and generates a cluster of hydroxyl radicals that can cleave the backbone of DNA. Uh, and if it cleaves, if a single event cleaves two backbones uh, of DNA, you can get a single-stranded fragment out. And the ends of that single stranded fragment were within two nanometers of one another in the folded chromatin structure. So if we've got a bunch of different possible structures, um, these little bombs go off and generate single stranded fragments, and different fragment distributions come out of different folded structures. Uh, okay, and so that's the theory, and this is what it actually looks like. So this is what the gels look like. Red here is the actual chromatin. You can see interesting structure here. And when we sequence that, we see we recapitulate the, the structure of the gel, and here's some theoretical uh, distribution of what these fragments should look like. Uh, we can map it back to, for example, CTF, CTCF start sites. So this is a V-plot showing the nucleosomes, and these are 
fragments generated from half nucleosome, all, one wrap around a nucleosome. Uh, and we can look at these, uh, these fragments here and then make a contact map with respect to a single uh, nucleosome here. And this is the theory we would expect from a crystal structure. And then we can start to say, okay, um, let's look at all fragments that have a start here and an end somewhere else. Where do those ends map? And actually in the red, you see more and more map there. And we're actually starting to get sort of um, near crystallographic resolution of, uh, and, and then we're trying to start to fold chromatin at this length scale. Um, and you can also see here, um, this is our uh, insert distribution here. And uh, if we bin uh, along heterochromatic or active transcription start sites, there's uh, depletions at specific locations suggesting, for example, this two nucleosome peak is enriched in heterochromatic regions and depleted in active transcription start sites. So we're getting some compaction information. Uh, so maybe one way of, of starting to fill in what I think is a gap in, in our understanding of, of chromatin. Okay, so. Number two, understanding functional elements in single cells. There's been a lot of talk about this. There's, there's methods like single cell methylation. Uh, there's single cell high c recent paper, uh, really interesting, trying to understand how uh, chromatin is folded in different ways in different individual cells. There's lots of interesting techniques uh, for doing droplets and doing RNA or chromatin analysis within droplets. And we've been working on uh, methods of trying to do single cell attack seq, which is a method for looking at open chromatin regions on small numbers of cells. So why single cells? Well, I mean, it's, maybe it's obvious, but here's my other mapping analogy. Um, if you want to look at all the boats that go from San Francisco to New York, they can either go through the Panama Canal or they can go all the way around the tip of Tierra del Fuego. The average boat, though, goes through the middle of Brazil, which, of course, doesn't ever happen, right? So that's a big problem. That's all of our data. It all goes through the middle of Brazil, effectively. So. So um, here's what single cell attack seq looks like. Here's the Duke DNA uh, uh, in, in GM12878. Here's bulk um, uh, attack seq actually uh, here. And here's aggregated attack seq from 100 and, uh, about 250 cells. And you can see high correlation. But of course now we actually get to see the path of every boat, I guess. Um, every uh, column here is a different individual cell. And what you can see here are, are the reads that we're observing in those individual cells. And what we can now then do is look at correlations. So this is extremely sparse data. Every uh, cell can either have zero or uh, one or two reads at any specific locus generally. Um, so it's much different from RNA-seq data, for example. So the way we've been looking at this is looking at uh, open chromatin regions that are correlated with transcription factor binding, so asking if peaks that are associated with specific transcription factors, if they vary more or less than we would have expected by chance. Uh, and then we can look at that deviation here, the, this, this, this clustering is of K562s, H1ESCs, and GM12878s. Uh, all of the cell types basically cluster out, uh, but we can see variability associated with specific transcription factors. Here's GATA motifs, H1ESCs, GMs, June factors, and NF-kappa B. So all of these, these cells cluster out, but you you can see within, even within these cell lines, we see significant variability in GATA motifs, for example, for uh, K562s, and in NF-kappa B, we see uh, variability in the GMs. So now we're starting to um, try and understand. Uh, uh, so we can do this for lots of different uh, cell types, uh, GMs, K562s, EML, TF, mouse ESCs, HL60s, and BJs, and of course, all of this um, is sort of enabled by the amazing data sets that's been generated by ENCODE, so we can look at uh, variability in NF-kappa B, GATA factors, June FOSS, and, and NANOG, for example. And the other thing we can ask is, are there correlations along the linear genome? So, for example, if I go across the genome, um, are, is there enrichments or depletions uh, in individual cells as a function of, say, 25 uh, peaks at a time, and we see significant structure here. And then we can ask, are there uh, regions uh, along the genome that seem to vary uh, together. And if we look at that, uh, we actually see uh, correlations that are very similar to this chromosome, chromatin, sorry, chromosome confirmation capture. So we're, so we're recapitulating sort of high-level megabase scale chromatin structure um, with the variability observations in single cells. Um, so the single cell analysis avoids this ensemble averaging. Um, it, it, it allows the statistical correlations and regulatory state to provide evidence of functional linkage between elements. I think if we had more cells, we would be able to say if specific open chromatin regions are correlating together, which is uh, sort of uh, a statistical argument for them being functionally linked. Uh, and I think in the future it would be wonderful to try and go after simultaneous single cell regulatory information in RNA-seq from the same cell, uh, which would couple sort of the what and the why of the cell cellular variability. Okay, fine, so I don't have a lot of time yet left, but the other two things I want to talk about, uh, this is sort of a, uh, a, a slide aimed maybe at NIH people, uh, maybe understanding a mechanism or establishing causality does not necessarily imply hypothesis-driven. Um, hypotheses maybe 
at NHGRI is a dirty word, but I think we can almost do hypothesis-less mechanistic studies to try and understand uh, causation. And here's my uh, little pitch for two ways of potentially going about that. Um, so everyone's seen this. This is the tritus slide in genomics. Um, but uh, well, there is this functional genomics bottleneck. We have a really hard time, I would argue, uh, linking sequence variation to structure and function changes in biomolecules. Um, and one of the things we're interested in doing is trying to do this um, in a very quantitative way, extremely high throughput, um, actually on the uh, sequencing instrument itself. Um, so it turns out if you want to do lots of different measurements across a d lots of different sequence space, DNA is a combinatorial polymer, so you might want to make combinatorial changes to s DNA sequence and see how that affects structure and function of binding to the DNA or the molecules encoded. Well, this is a wonderful uh, uh, sort of uh, machine that allows you to do billions of measurements at a time on something that I can hold in my hand. Um, so this is uh, actually an idea that was pioneered by Chris Burge's lab, um, where you can use the sequencer as a post hoc DNA array. You can then, um, uh, you know the sequence of every potential uh, cluster here, uh, and then you can add in uh, DNA binding proteins, for example, transcription factors, or even, oops, or even uh, initiate an RNA polymerase and ask um, um, uh, about structure or binding to RNA, or even uh, the ability for RNA polymerase to initiate a specific site, get, which gets more into uh, understanding the requirements of transcription and, and how uh, elements uh, might, be, might be doing that. So we label these binding elements. We can label elements that may bind to RNA or DNA. Here's what the experiment looks like. Maybe I don't have time for this. Well, maybe I do. Where's Okay, so the experiment just looks like this. So we flush out all the protein. We allow it to come in uh, at higher and higher concentrations. We build up a binding curve across all of these structures. We let it flow out. E every cluster has a different sequence, of course. So now we're getting huge amounts of uh, thermodynamic and kinetic information across sequence space. Here's what that looks like, binding curves from individual clusters. We do lots of clusters so we get good measurements. So we can reconstruct a comprehensive functional landscape for this uh, molecule and actually understand how uh, mutations or combinations of mutations in this case, these are all double mutants, um, allow another binding protein, RNA binding protein, to come in. Okay. Um, and it turns out pirating sequencing instruments is relatively cheap and easy. The GA2 six years ago was maybe $600,000 instrument, and now it's free. It's like a big paperweight. People give them away. It's really fun. You can get them, and if you open this up, it looks like it was built by a grad student. Um, there are actual structural cable ties in that thing that you can cut away and then have fun with. Um, and then we, what we can do is do our sequencing on our MySeq, put it on the guts of this GA, GA2, and build our own custom imaging station, which uh, allows us to do these high throughput uh, quantitative biochemical methods. And we can clone this thing for real cheap. Um, so multicolor uh, capabilities allow for the possibility of binding multiple factors and understanding cooperativity, for example, at a very uh, quantitative uh, manner at specific loci. Uh, the quantitative biophysical models of complex molecular interactions across sequence space with enhancers or whole genomes or even uh, trying to understand the uh, machine, how transcription itself uh, uh, starts, which I think links to Frank's um, uh, uh, questions. Uh, also this allows a predictive understanding of sequence perturbations on both uh, DNA binding proteins potentially, but also uh, encoded macromolecules like RNA, a direct application to interpretation of genomic variants. Okay, finally, no talk in this day and age is complete without something uh, to do with CRISPRs. Um, so here is a quick pitch for maybe one way to do uh, CRISPR-based high-throughput functional screens uh, in an analogy to high-throughput shRNA screens. And again, uh, basically, the, uh, this idea and the figures are courtesy of Mike Bassick. Um, so back in the day, you, you could make um, lots and lots of uh, uh, shRNAs. You could infect cells with them. Um, some of them could be selected or unselected. And then you could determine which uh, knockdowns of specific genes were important uh, in, the, in the selected phenotype. For example, let's say I added rice in here. Which genes do I knock down which allow uh, uh, me to survive ricin or to die faster in ricin? So suddenly I have a sense of which genes are important in, in this regulation. And then what I could do is pool, I can ligate these uh, shRNAs together and do double knockdowns and then understand whether or not these two genes were buffering or synergistic together 
right? And, and then build back networks of, of understanding. So this is a way of understanding the interactions of, of genes, potentially, of which genes are important and also their interaction. Um, but now we have CRISPR. So CRISPRs can be targeted anywhere in the, lot, in the genome, effectively, with a SH, uh, sgRNA guide. Um, and also, the people have fused to this Cas9 uh, molecule, some stuff like crab uh, domain to, to repress or a, a VP60 to activate, and effectively anything could be uh, fused to this Cas9. You can, you can target any guy and anything that's going to recruit anything else uh, to this Cas9, and then you can make this library of different sgRNAs uh, and do the same thing, and you can actually also do this combinatorial kind of thing, where you have two sgRNAs, uh, for example, and, and then you... Um, and then you can either knock, that, knock out or change two specific locations or knock out a region entirely by cutting on either side of it. And effectively, this works. So what would this look like? Okay. Okay. Right? So here's an experimental outline for understanding functional relevance of, uh, uh, it, let's say, enhancers of gene I of N genes. What we really need is um, some mapping between, say, growth rate and gene expression level. So there's lots of different ways to potentially do this for hundreds of genes. So I can dial in gene expression under some uh, stress conditions and, and make a mapping between gene expression and growth rate. And of course, I'm probing growth rate by sequencing all the sgRNAs before and after my screen. So uh, this is the basal level. Let's say I use a CRISPR knockout. I knock this guy out. I, I measure the growth rate. I, I infer gene expression. Now I have a quantitative metric for understanding how this uh, element affects gene expression. And then I can add my CRISPR I. This is a re repressing protein, and that might change some other way. I add a CRISPR A. I, I increase um, gene expression level. Um, and then I kind of got sick of animating, but the idea is you can also do combinatorial things, right? So now you can add multiple different elements, and this is something Aviv was talking about. There's a combinatorial logic to these um, elements that are regulating uh, expression. Uh, so mapping from one gene to hundreds uh, of growth defects is needed, but then we could do uh, this CRISPR IA and knockout targeted every putative potential regulatory element and sub elements within the elements. Uh, pairwise combinations would really uh, get back uh, some understanding of what's going on uh, in, a, in, a, in a predictive way, high throughput quantitative pic picture, um, comprehensive quantitative measure of elements, gene expression, uh, and insight into their additive regulatory logic. Okay, I went over, I apologize, uh, but that is it, and thanks to the people in my lab that generated some of this data, and Howard, who's a collaborator. And, and you guys, thank you so much. Okay, I'm done. Thanks. Thanks, Will. Can we have everybody come back up, Lori and uh, Ross and...